Well, let me say that it's tough for me to maintain professionalism and be a super fan. So I'm going to balance it here. I love that. See, I'm a super fan too. No, I never miss you. But I'm go- we're going to keep this about you. And okay, well then let me just get right out of the way the fact that every morning, on the way to school, on the way back to school, I listen to you guys and I laugh my ass. Off. Okay, thank you. Can I say that ass word? Oh, sure, you say okay. whatever you want. Okay, yeah, yeah, there are no right. rules on this. Okay, okay, okay. We're going to. This is going to be a long form, and then we're going to take it and put it on national shows. So you oh, okay. can say anything. You can beep that F- out then. C- Anything no, you want, no, drop it. No, we, we can edit it. We have a swear jar in my kitchen. You do? Yeah, oh, yes. And who pays into the swear jar? Anybody that swears. Period. Period. So yes. if Liz has even had to pay into the swear jar. And w- are there prices? Yes, that are twenty dollars for the F word. Okay, so we are the tearing number. them. Okay. Yeah, that's the big number. Yeah. What if you say the C word? Does that? Con- my is- kids don't know that word. Okay, we yeah. were talking about that on the show. Like, what are curse words? Like, yeah, that's that's low form. Yeah. Is it a curse word, though? Because it is a, uh, a really inappropriate word. I'd say, oh, uh, that's interesting. I just assume that inappropriate words are, are curse words. I did a thesis my senior year to be an honors graduate, and it was almost 80 pages, and I did it on Carlin's the seven words you can't say. And so my theory was eventually some of them you would be able to say, and a couple of them you can say now. Mm-hmm. But I've always been infatuated with curse words and why we assign different levels of severity to yeah. just a different sound yeah and our culture has just said you know the word blah means nothing right but if you say the f word just your tongue working in a certain fashion it means okay i'm sure you're gonna edit this out but my my fifth grader uh in second grade came home from school christian school uh big tuition christian school mom what's the p word you said the word and I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> He's seven. He wants to know what the word, you know. And What I do you s- tell him? I said, it's a kitty cat. You know, it's a pussy cat. That is true. But I, but I did say, but you know what? But he's like, well, I thought it was a bad word. I said, some words, if you use them with intention to be bad, they're bad words. So but, you have to watch what you say. And, yeah, it, you don't want to say that word if you mean it ugly. The reason I was talking about it, it's so mm-hmm. funny you brought this up, is I haven't because I write, I just finished, I have a kid's book coming out in June. And so even my stand-up is completely clean. And so I don't want to write using curse words. So I haven't said a curse word in like five years. Good for you. And I'm not anti. I like to hear them. I used to like to say them. But I, in the creative process, I don't Mm -hmm. want to use them as crutches or rhymes. Yeah. Because it just seems easy. Yeah. But so I will say if the place is hell, if we're referring to a place Mm -hmm. of hell, great. But I will not use that word if it is used as a way of describing something. That's what we say in the car yeah. if we're talking about the place. Yeah. It's interesting. I grew up around swear words, and I don't swear around my kids ever. You don't even slip? I did say dumbass one day. Because <laughs> <laughs> somebody passed me on Hillsboro, and it scared me. And then immediately my boys were like, dumbass, dumbass. I was like, no, 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 no. That is, it doesn't work like that. Well, I'm I'm so happy you're here, and... You know, when watching the documentary, the thing that I took from it is I, again, I am a super fan and I knew most, your parents were interesting. Yeah. Because I did, I don't know them personally or yeah. I haven't spent any time seeing them places. Yeah, yeah. So that was interesting. And then obviously like a good documentary does, you went so much deeper into certain parts that I only knew about. Mm-hmm. Some of them probably comfortable, some of them probably very uncomfortable to talk about. Oh, yeah. But, and you... And I want to make this slightly about me for a second and just see, because I was trying to find any parallels that we would have. And I, when I wrote my first book, it was a long story about how it ended up happening, but it was a memoir. And I was like, nobody wants to read this. And I remember writing a part of it where, because my mom was an addict and she died in her 40s. I didn't, my dad left early. Um, my grandmother adopted me and I was, I was moving around a bunch. But at one point, and it was really hard for me to write about and talk about, my mom, who was a really bad addict and is no longer with us, she had called and said, hey, if you don't give me money, I'm going to do porn. And it was it was so hard for, and I wasn't, mm. and it's still hard to even talk about. Yeah. And I wasn't putting it in the book to go, look what I've been through, but it was, this is the situation, mm-hmm. how it affected me, what I learned from it. And I wonder in some of the things that you talked about in this, I was very uncomfortable sharing it. Yeah. 
Did you have to give yourself kind of that pep talk I had to give myself when talking about things? Oh, yeah. I mean, initially, when my manager came to me and said, hey, pandemic, you got a lot of interest in, in doing a documentary. I was like, absolutely not. For one thing, you do documentaries after you're dead, you know, and those were the ones I loved, you know, Nina Simone. I, I mean, it, and that was so, so good. The Nina Simone was so good. Please. I yeah. mean, there's so many good ones. I mean, even even though they're not all dead, but I binge watched the Beatles and it totally changed the way I felt about making music again. But that aside, I, I wound up giving into it and I said, look, it's can't be. And I loved VH1 and they definitely were instrumental in my career, but I was like, it cannot be like a feel good behind the music over dramatized. And, um, and I picked somebody to produce it that I, I liked her taste. I liked her sensibilities. And then we got to work. It was Hard. And it was, I mean, it was, it was really, for one thing, it was, it was exhausting because you're trying to dig back through all the memories. You don't ever sit down and think about your life like that. You don't ever sit down and like dig back through, I mean, really ostensibly 40 years. I mean, I, it started before I was even a school teacher and I knew there was stuff that was going to be really hard to talk about, you know, being sexually harassed for a year and having people die along the way, you know, not only John O'Brien, but Kevin Gilbert, who I was very close to, you know, died in the middle of my second record. And I mean, I got beat up in the press and this is before social media and everything was my fault. And I, I just, you know, at a certain point you go, okay, is the story worth telling? Yeah. Well, there are lots of facets to it. It's hard to be a woman in any business. It's definitely hard to be a woman in the music business, anywhere where it's creative and it's all run by men. And how do we monetize? How do we make money off this person? It's worse, I think, now. Um, but, um, yeah, it was really uncomfortable. And I, I didn't love that part of it. I also found when I was doing it, not to the level that you're doing, but I just mm -hmm. know what it's like to have to redig through things. I also found some joys that I had not mm -hmm. felt I celebrated enough. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, and a new, not a new, a, I revisited an appreciation that I had for people in my life that were so instrumental. Yeah. My grandmother who adopted me and, and was like the one person that loved me. And so, and, and I definitely want to get to some, specific, totally make me cry. to some specific things, but as I'm like watching and knowing your story and seeing you go through this, and I know it's a struggle to do it. Did you, and I would like an example if you have one, did you like rediscover a joy that maybe you had tucked away when going through the last 40 years? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's it's a, it's a really a challenge to sit and hold an emotion. So we don't. You know, I mean, I can remember the first Grammys, which totally changed my life and my career. We got on the bus after the Grammys, after the parties, and drove up to San Francisco, and I played the next next night like it never happened. And that was the way my whole career was. I, I never owned anything. I always felt like, well, it wasn't, you know, it just always felt like I was an imposter to me. And going back through it and seeing the transition, especially after having breast cancer, that transition of going, okay, that was all a crazy dream to go from being a small town girl to becoming like the height of fame and then it all suddenly jerking to a stop um, and and experiencing a reboot. I mean, just looking at where I am now and how I feel about life and how I feel about who I am, I'm really happy and I'm super, I'm proud of who I am. I'm so grateful that all the experiences that I had helped me to remember who I am, you know, not not who I became, but who I came in as and you know it's life is so unpredictable and it's so not smooth but you have all these experiences that sort of force you to return to who you authentically are and that to me was the surprise of making the documentary is being able to look at it um, and there there are 10 other documentaries that didn't get made that are on the cutting room floor I mean things that we we they didn't put in and watching it, I felt like, oh, my gosh, that's only a slice of it. But you can only use 90 minutes. So Unless you do the Beatles documentary, and then you just put it all yes. up there. Yes. doing all of it. That's after I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let me let me start with whenever it comes to – I have a jukebox over at the house, which is that direction. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a lot of albums in it. I have like 20. 
And then those 20 are the ones that um, ha- have been kind of the soundtracks of my life at different stages. Mm-hmm. It's a CD jukebox, so yeah. it can't just download. or. But one of the top five or six albums ever for me is Tuesday Night Music Club. Mm-hmm. Like my, I can think of where I was. That's the strength of music, and I bet you could do this with a couple of albums as well. I know where I was, what part of my life I was going through. I mean, I knew where I was, everything about that based on when that first couple notes of those songs hit Mm -hmm. and how your brain reacts and remembers, Mm -hmm. like that was one of those albums for me. Oh, that's awesome. When you, what was a couple of those for you that you really credit to shaping your early teenage years? Well, this has nothing to do with it. It definitely shaped my teenage years. Now, I came up when... um, well, first and foremost, I was raised in a family where music was played all the time, like ad nauseum. And by like music played out loud or played with instruments around um, you? played with instruments and on the Magna Box. And my parents were in a swing band. They played tons of like um, big band music. Then as that kind of faded out of their lives, we always had the music going. It was everything from um, Aretha Franklin to Motown to Willie Nelson to my little town played only country music and like true diehard country music. But I grew up when it was like Boston, Foreigner, Kansas, um, a lot of Fleetwood Mac. But Fleetwood Mac was the record. Rumors. I mean, I remember I got my hair cut like hers. I, I had shawls. I would dance around with a curling iron. I mean, I was just so, I want to be Stevie Nicks so bad. Um, but it's really funny. There are a couple of songs that will come on, and I can even smell, mm. like um, Baker Street. Do you know that song? Uh, Jerry Raff- Jerry Rafferty. Baker Street comes on. It's like, oh, yeah, Mike Brown's brown leather bucket seats in his Cutlass Supreme, you know, parking out by, by the old bridge. I mean, there are songs that just do that where you are you can remember exactly what the smells were, where you were, circling Dairy Queen. But all that music, when I hear it, all that old classic rock, I'm I'm out. I'm circling, circling the main drag between Dairy Queen and A and W. Yeah, that's how I feel with Tuesday Night Music Club. And when it comes to those songs, you know, when you walked in, we we're talking for a second, and you were to you to tell me something good, which is a segment we do. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, full transparency here, I do that segment so many times, and I'm glad I it has been a big part of our mm-hmm. show in the six. But I do it all the time, and I've done it all the time for years and years. You start to go, man, I know people love it, but i got to keep doing it. Do you feel that way about some of the, oh some of God. your songs? Okay, it's funny. I was listening to you guys this morning. I was like, your show is always so good and fun and funny, um, has emotional highs. I mean, it's just a really great show. And I sat there and thought, I wonder if he ever just gets sick <laughs> of doing that show. You know what I mean? And also being, uh, being present. Cause it's hard work, man. Like there's some nights where I walk out on stage and I have to like fake it until I make it. And generally those are the best shows. But there was a period where if I thought I had to play all I want to do one more time, I would just run straight out in front of a Mack truck. Um, and it took, it took my, I mean, part of it is it took my getting sick to really realize that song took me to Russia. I mean, that ta- song took me all over, um, all over the Middle East. I mean, we went to Israel. We went to we went to Tokyo, to Kuala Lumpur, to Indonesia. We went all over South America. People who couldn't speak English sang every word of that wordy song. And I had, I just embraced a full-on gratitude. And I enjoy playing it now. But there were a few years in there where I was just like, oh, God, I'm sick of this song. You know, I hate this song. I hate this song. Um, but I love it, you know. I think part of what happens is as you get older, you get really, you know, you get sentimental and you get really grateful and um, you get really boring. And I love being boring now. It's cool to reappreciate. It is, it is. Because I've started to find myself reappreciating not just professional things, but also personal things. And so it's cool that you have, because I, I live it. And one day I'm going to like doing Tell Me Something's Good again. Yeah. One day I'm going to, and, and I don't you hate You can't it. tell that you don't like it, though. I mean, I will say that. It's not even that I don't like it. It's that, as you do, you you're play just the same worn song. Out. It's just we do it four, four times a day. Yeah. Five days a week. Yeah. 20 times. And 
individually, all the stories are great. But it's like, man, I have this 20 times again this week. Do you hate Shaka Khan now? No, no, I don't. <laughs> I, I, Rufus, cool with me. Shaka Khan, cool with me. Uh, and we go places, and what's funny, sometimes I'll go into a place if it's a bar or a restaurant. I don't go to bars as much anymore, but they'll play that song over the top, like, once they see I'm there. Oh, my gosh. And, like, that's so been associated with, yeah. I'll, I'll just beat, or a uh, basketball game, mm -hmm. and you'll hear, dun, 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 and I'll look up, and, like, and you'll see the guy running, pointing at me, and like, all right, yeah, oh, hey, buddy. Yeah, so, yeah. did you ever, you, you talk about Stevie Nicks, did you ever have a relationship with her? Did you guys ever? Oh, my gosh. Like, that had to be the coolest thing. I have so many weird experiences um, with people like that. Okay, so I, like, uh, if you dig back through the annals of my um, my school pictures, I had the Stevie Nicks hairdo. And um, I met her at my first Grammys. I met her at an after party, and I have a picture with her and Anita Pointer and Bonnie Raitt and Carly Simon and me. And I was the newbie. And she's like, I love you. Um, would you, I'm getting ready to do some songs for Practical Magic, that that movie. Would you produce it? And I was like, uh, yeah. And she came to New York, and, and she had her posse, you know, some bunch of women. And, um, and I produced her, and it was just, it was unbelievable. I can remember looking at her out um, in the recording booth, and she looked like a 14-year-old. I mean, literally, she looked like she had not aged a day. She looked exactly as I remembered her. And she just was, like, so embracing and so... Gener to like told stories like I, I imagine that we probably talked and hung out for two hours and then she'd sing and then we'd hang out and talk for a couple of hours and then she'd sing and it was but it was so glorious and then she said will you re produce the record and I went up producing and going on the road with her and she's just been like fairy godmom to me and I, I don't want you to say any names here but I have had experiences where I really was like loved people got to know them mm -hmm. not that cool Ruin the experience. Okay, yeah, yeah. People that I would, I, and I, I now uh, don't really idolize. It, yeah. Except for like hearts. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but there have been times where that's happened, and I'm like, well, I cannot believe I get to spend time. We're gonna do, and then you're like, oh man, I kind of wish I wouldn't have yeah. because it's ruined what yeah. I cherish, which was these these beliefs. And yeah, I'm with how massive you got. I had to assume that happened to some. Um. I will say I've been really lucky. Almost everybody I've met has been beyond, beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I got a few people I want to introduce you to then. Yeah, I bet <laughs> we'll, you do. We'll fix that. <laughs> we'll fix that uh, a few relatives. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, um, interestingly, I worked with Michael Jackson before I uh, hit it big. I was a backup singer. Went on the road with him for 18 months. And... Uh, there were some things on that tour I was just like, this doesn't make sense. And then later on the documentary came out. And, um, I mean, he, he was he was already eccentric on that tour. But people ask me all the time, are you able to listen to his music? And I'm like, man, that was the first album I ever owned. I got it from Santa Claus when I was five years old, ABC. I grew up watching his TV show. I, um, you know, all that music was was important to me. And it definitely changed the way I felt about him. And But I can still listen to the music from when he was a kid because I feel like he was who he was then. He wasn't who he became. But for the most part, I mean, I can't really think of anybody that's just been a douchebag, you know what I mean? Can you separate art and artist? It depends. I mean, it, it depends. They're, um, I mean, we're kind of looking at that with the Will Smith thing now. It's like, okay, are we going to be able to watch the movies? Can we take out that, you know? Um... It depends. I think it's on how severe. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah. R. Kelly no, dead. No. Will never even. I, no. If it comes on somewhere, I'll leave. Yeah. Like. No. Uh. But again, there are artists. Again, if if uh, Smooth Criminal comes on, that was. I'm probably just jamming along to it before I realize. Yeah. And then the song's over, and then I don't want to leave because I got a burger, and I'm half, you know <laughs> feeling pretty good. I did meet. It's interesting. I met a young artist who totally blew up who I had the weirdest experience with, and I can't listen to her music. I wouldn't say her name, but, um, I mean, became massive. And, you know, there are just certain people that you go, okay, they got into it so they could be famous. 
And then there are other people that you go, um, oh, I can totally relate to this person. They're just, they, they love what they do. They're so into it. And they wrote the book on this and they're still cool. Whenever um, you were, you were blowing up and it, it always feels different than what it looks like. Oh yeah. Um, but what we knew about you from pre social media days was, Hey, she was a teacher and now she's doing music. And a lot of the, the like the background singer from Michael Jackson, the jingle, all that came out kind of later once more information was just available. Yeah. But it was teacher to rock and roll star. And so overnight. I, oh, yeah. The overnight <laughs> stuff's tough. I get that too. And I'm like, overnight, but I was 30 when my first record came out. So let's talk about <laughs> that part. So you were teaching, were you teaching music? Yeah. And St. Louis school system. And what, what ages were you teaching? I taught kindergarten through sixth music in the public school system in Fenton, which is in, um, it's part of St. Louis, but we had a lot of kids from the, um, uh, it was a, I can't remember which, which car factory, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, rural, rural St. Louis. So when you're teaching music, do you still have a dream of, well, anything on a macro type stage? Like, like, what's your dream when you're teaching in St. Louis? Oh, 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 oh. Um, well, I, I don't even know if this is in the documentary. You know, I've been engaged three times. And um, I was engaged when I got out of school. I was engaged to the guitar player in the band I was in. We moved to St. Louis. He was born again Christian. I was a Christian, too. But he was like, "You, if you're going to not sing for the Lord, if you're going to be in bands, we can't get married. And... I'd already seen, signed my teaching contract. I was in a band. I just loved singing, and I loved playing. I was a keyboard player. and. But did you have dreams of yeah, well, making it big? After that, um, I just, you know, I was always writing songs. I started getting gigs by myself in um, coffee bars, and I loved it. And I thought, you know, if I'm ever going to do this, I should try and do it now. I'm not engaged. I'm I'm. I'm young, and so I moved to California with a bunch of tapes. It, it was so different than it is now. I mean, there weren't the big vehicles like The Voice or anything like that. I mean, you basically went out there and you tried to get into the parties where the celebrities were. You tried to get in, you know, you tried to get, you put bands together. You tried to get heard. You had to pay to play. You had to, like, it was a grind. And But on the flip side of it, you could also go out and figure out who you were without having the eyes of YouTube on you, you know, and I got really lucky. I took my tape to every, every studio and I started getting some work as a background singer, found out about the Michael Jackson tour by hearing other singers talk about it, crashed the audition. I mean, I just, I don't know if I n knew I would make it. Like I've talked to like Gwyneth Paltrow and I used to be very good friends and even Stevie, I'm like, it's interesting. Did you always know you were going to be famous? Absolutely. Always knew it. Both of, both of them, they always just knew they were going to be famous. I never in a million years, I would have been in the yearbook, like, least likely to become a rock star. Super nice person, like, work really hard. Things will happen. And that was kind of what I thought, you know. Leaving the stability. Hey, would you turn the, yeah. oh, thank would you you. Turn the air down a little bit? It's pretty warm in here. Leaving the stability of a job like a teaching job. Oh, I have like a rhino in here. <laughs> when you have to leave the stability. <clears throat> Bobby Bones and I out on the African <laughs> terrain. When you have to leave the stability of a job, like a teaching job. And, you know, I grew up in Arkansas, so we did, I didn't know anybody. Where did you grow up in Arkansas? Like Central, Hot Springs. Oh, my, yeah. my town's 700 people, Mountain Pine, but yeah. near Little Rock. We used to drive to Blyville to go see the movies. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. My but, orthodontist was in Jonesboro. I know it well, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's a big jump because some friends that I have just moved to Nashville, but they were 19. Yeah. They, they, they weren't getting a check, and they hadn't already developed how to pay the bills, right. how to budget, how to do adult things. And you're playing music, but you're also giving up an actual paycheck and a job. I got to think that you're not 18. That was did not that not weigh into it at all? Like, or are you just like, screw it, I'm going. Like, I got I one think, shot. You know, it's when I... If I'm really honest with my th myself, I think I would have gone right out of high school. But my parents were always like, you know, you need to have something to fall back on. It was always something to fall back on. And then, you know, when I'm growing up, it's like you get married, you have kids. That's sort of the order of things. And then when that didn't happen, I, you know, I've 
got my degree. I taught. I was engaged. Everything looked like it was supposed to. And then when it fell apart, I was like, shoot, I'm just going to, I'm going to see what happens. You know, I'd save some money. I had $9,000 and I, I wound up going out to LA. I stayed with some friends and took all my tapes around. They were partying like crazy, like doing blow. I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, I was country bumpkin. Um, I wound up moving into a one-bedroom apartment, went through all my money, got a boot on my car. I mean, it was just, <laughs> you couldn't pay for the boot to come off. I was eating Trail Max from uh, Publix across the street. Started getting some work, waiting tables, and um, finally got a commercial. I don't know. I mean, I think I was so naive, but also I just was, I was just really convicted. I just really wanted, I wanted to be heard, you know, and now, you know, after therapy and reflection and all that, I realized I was a kid that wanted everybody to be happy and I was going to make them happy. And if they weren't happy, then I wasn't doing something right. And I think there are a lot of people that become famous or well-known that have that story. Like, if I can just make people happy, then I'll know what it feels like to be loved. Well, I did four seasons on American Idol as their head mentor. Yes, and I know. What, what, um, anybody can, there's so many people that are more skilled in music than me. I mean, me al- too. almost everybody. Me too. And what the producer told me after they hired me, because I went and I was talking about song selection and performance. And yeah. What hooked them was me telling one of the kids, until I came to L.A. for work. I'd never been anywhere like this or New York. I'm from Arkansas. We didn't see big buildings like this. So I was relating to them in that way. But I was like, I know what you're feeling like. Like, I, this stuff's still crazy to me. Did you experience that going to Los Angeles or did you have? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I drove a Renault Alliance um, all the way to Albuquerque. And um, I slept for 45 minutes in a bed that had a long black hair in it. Ugh, ugh. And I was like, okay, I'm not that really, that, not that tired. And I got into Los Angeles on the 405 at rush hour and sobbed. I mean, I was just like, what am I doing? I It looked like Mars to me. I'd never seen anything like it. And then I get to this house and these girls are all doing blow. I mean, it was a girl from my hometown. I was like, what, what? What is this? Is this Babylon or something? Like, what culture am I now involved? What have I yeah. dropped myself into? Yeah. And um, a huge learning curve. And within a year, and I'd never been out of my own country. And within a year, I was singing with Michael Jackson, arguably the biggest star in the world, in front of 75,000 people in Tokyo. And so it was just a massive, massive um, thrown into the fire figure it out, and, um, yeah, I mean, I was just absolutely naive, and I still feel like that. I mean, like, we're going home next weekend for Easter, and I always say we're going home, and my kids are like, why do you say home? This Mm. is home, and I'm like, I can't help it. I'm so, that is my small town. That's interesting. I do the same thing. Yeah. I talk about going home home to Arkansas. Yeah. It's like, we don't live, I'm like, I, I guess we always have our home. Yeah. You know, we'll always have our and that's home. that's the part of what's inside of you, and that doesn't ever leave. And the further away I got from home, the more the more I could relate to my small town roots. How'd you get the Michael Jackson background singing job? I crashed an audition. Um, you're supposed to be recommended by like Bruce Sweetine or um, any Rod Temperton, Quincy Jones, and I found out where it was, and I went, and they some guy was there, and he's like. Tell me about yourself. I said, my name's Cheryl. I just moved. I'm Cheryl Crow. I just moved here from um, St. Louis. I'm a school teacher. I'm doing some backup work. And they're like, okay, what do you want to sing? And I sang. And then I got a call back the next day. And I sang with three guys. And about a week later, we were rehearsing. What would you sing? Do you remember? I sang, um, and I've got to be free. Uh, a Denise Williams song. And, and do you try to sing it like a... Because if I went to a background backup singer audition, mm-hmm. I would just be like, ooh. This is how I do it, backups. <laughs> la, 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 la. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, ooh, do you ooh, go... Uh, 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 do they ask you to sing as a... I have no idea. I'm, this is no. a real dumb guy question. Do you sing as your le- a lead when they say sing? Yeah, they want to hear your voice. But I think as as much as that, I mean, I think they... 
they looked at me and thought, oh, she looks pretty harmless, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I was a white girl with really curly hair. Um, I don't know why they picked me. It's, it's, I still go, I mean, it's that same thing where you're talking about, oh, there are people that are more musical than me. I'm like, why did I make it? I, there are people that are way more talented, that write incredible songs, that sing great, and why, why me? And that part of it is such a mind bender because I do believe there's a certain amount of order to the chaos, but I also think there's a huge argument for manifesting things, that where you put your energy, it does, you do get something back from that. And I just kept showing up in my own story. I just kept showing up. As you are performing on this tour with Michael Jackson, are you also hustling as in making sure people know that you're you? No, because I didn't know who you was yet. Mm. So, But we all took recording, um, little recording studios with us, four tracks, and I would write, I wrote all the time. The guy that was on the tour that ultimately became my manager would be like, hey, we're going down to the... Lexington Queen or whatever, you know, like the where all the models hang out. And I was like, nah, I'm going to stay in tonight. We're, we're in Tokyo. No, nah, I want to work on my music. You know, I I would, I would just worked all the time. When did you kind of figure out who you were, what you wanted to say, and why you wanted to say it? Oh, about three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the first time. <laughs> I think after the first record. The first record blew up. Um. And I was still like... Say after the first record? Did I hear that right? Yeah, after the first record. The first... I made a record that cost a ton of money with a really high-profile manager named Hugh Padgham um, who had produced Sting, and and I hated the record. It was super, super slick. In fact, it sounded like girl singing Sting. And I was just like, no, 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 this isn't what it was supposed to sound like. It was supposed to rock, you know? And um, so I went to the record label and said, please... Let me have another shot at this. This is not... Is if that you, the first record you're talking about? The yeah, one I've not heard? Yeah, very first record. Got it, okay. $450,000. Now, Got that's it. 30 years ago, so that's like a million bucks. And they're like, okay, finally. They, they were like, we'll give you another shot. And I sat around for a, quite a long time and hooked up with Bill Betrell and made the Tuesday Night Music Club record, which was a total blast to make. But there were several people that were sort of around and... We jammed, and that's how we got started. And then once it became my record, I started working with Bill on my own, and there was a lot of bitterness once it started taking off. Like once everybody started making money, it was there, there complications. Was complications. Yeah. And even though all the publishing was split, and everybody was making the same amount of money, I was devastated. I was like, "Why is everybody so mad? Nobody wanted to go on the road." So why was everybody so mad? Um. In the least complicated explanation you can well, give Well, the least complicated explanation I could say is that nobody wanted to go on the road because they all had their own gigs. You know, David and David, um, all of them amazing artists in their own right. But they didn't want to go. And so I went to back to St. Louis. I put together a band, band together with locals. Once the record took off, then they were like, we want to be in the band. I was like, well, I can't fire my band. I mm. mean, they've been with me during the hard part. And uh, anyway, so the second record, I think, when I went in and I wound up producing it on my own, that's when I was like, okay, I'm just going to make a record I like. I'm just going to make music the way I make it. And if nobody likes it, that's cool. And that was the one that was self-titled and had, that makes you happy and everybody's winding road. And, you know, I felt more um, like, I didn't feel like I had to prove myself, but I definitely felt like this was more authentic. Do you... Do you resent the success of the first record that you don't have complete adoration for? No, not at all. I mean, I, I loved making that record. I loved being a part of that group of misfits, and I I loved them. Um, I was really sad, and I was really devastated by what happened in the end, and that was a big learning lesson for me. You know, money is a destroyer, and... I just, I, I didn't see that coming, you know. I don't know. I mean, I, I still, I still, and and once leaving Las Vegas when that came out and the guy that wrote the book killed himself and there was all kinds of weirdness around that, like I had known him and I'd, I'd never met him. Um, it was damaging. I mean, I, I it changed me. I, I, 
I started wearing like goth makeup. I was just like, don't talk to me. I'm not the girl next door. You're not, go- I'm not going to be your friend. I've already been people's friends and I saw how that worked out. And it totally changed me. And it took me a long time to start crying. It took me a long time to get back to feeling like my old self. Do you think, and not to sit on this too long, but as you're talking about this, and I'm very familiar with the story, because mm-hmm. uh, it's also talked about in the documentary. Yeah. Do you feel like that some of, of the negativity was from, because he killed himself, but people were beating up on you that weren't him. Do you feel like that was from others and not from him, or was it just about him? Because you guys didn't know each other. You said that yourself. No, and he didn't beat me up. It all came from the guys in the group. And there, there. I mean, honestly, there's only one guy in the group that I think had real problems with the truth, and that's a pathological thing. That's right. Had I known it, I probably would not have been. Um, I wouldn't have been around him. And 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 you know, truth be told, there are amazing pathological people that have pathological issues that are extremely. Um, extremely enticing. I, I mean, just like interesting people, people that are high achieving narcissists and pathological liars can be very um, engaging. But sometimes when you don't know that, um, you wind up on the wrong side of it. And you know, that's that's all I can say about that. I didn't know John O'Brien, but I did know he was somebody's son. And and had I known him, um. We, I wouldn't have written that song. I mean, I didn't know the title came from a book. Uh, so anyway, um, I also think that there is something that happens when you are you are unknown and people love you and they're, they're, they discover you and they feel like you're somebody that they discovered and they're extremely loyal. And then suddenly you become famous and people are dressing you and it's like, um, actually, so she's too big for her britches now, or whatever. And then the press turns against you, and I wasn't aware of that either. And we watch it every day. Yeah, it's know? so weird to see because it's like you can continue to get more famous, but at some point you're going to get so famous and popular that you're not popular anymore. Exactly. Like there's yeah. a threshold. Yes. We only allow you to get so popular yeah. before we have to turn on you, and you have to turn us back. Yeah. And it's an yeah. unfair thing. Yeah. Especially now because you can see it coming especially with an artist who's killing it. You know, yeah. well, let's hope that when everybody turns that they're able to withstand that and turn them back because I have yeah. friends that that was a real struggle for. Yeah. Um what is and I don't not to stay long on this part, but what is fame like when you first get just true freaking fame? Yeah. And- when you walk into a restaurant and they have a table or when you um when you never have to pay for anything. Like that's always been a weird thing. Like they're gonna send me clothes. Why? I mean, I'm happy with the stuff I bought at the you know secondhand place. Um, it's a it does a number on you for sure. And the number it did for did on me was, um, this is this is amazing. Um, I don't know if I deserve it. So you start questioning yourself. But then the other part of it is when you stop getting invited, or let's just say, um. In the, in the instances where you're not the most popular person on the red carpet, you start feeling insecure. It's like you get this bright, shiny coat of paint, and then suddenly there are little cracks in the veneer. Like, well, how do I, how do I, how do I smooth the crack out so I'm still, I'm still the most popular? And it really totally does a number on you. And then you start thinking about, okay, what, what do I have to write to, get, to stay in the top ten, to keep getting played at radio? And that's no good either. You're I mean, saying it changes your direction creatively from what do I have to say to there's a difference of yeah. what do I have to write yeah. that oh, yeah. people will like, not because I'm saying it and feeling it, but because yeah. I know I'm trying to chase what they like. Yeah. And then there is that moment where you're about to turn 40 and you're still popular, but um, everything on the radio is Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera and they're 17. And they're wearing schoolgirl outfits, and you're about to be 40. And that does a number, because 40 doesn't get played at radio. It's just a weird thing. You know, there's not anything realistic about it. And I do wonder with girls today that seem to be, like, um, navigating their own. They, they're in control of their social media. They project their images, and the images sometimes are sexual, or most of the time are sexual. And that... As long as they're in control of that, 
Like how much of it are they able to, because I, I don't read even a sentence about myself. I don't read anything because I'm too sensitive. Like how do girls now, especially when you're bringing looks into it and body image and all that, how do they not, how is it not demoralizing? Because fame to me was already like, okay, I'm a really private person and I'm a really nice person. So, and everything I'm reading about myself is, okay, I got my hair cut. Now I look like a soccer mom. I mean, just like mean stuff. How does anybody navigate it? I don't, I don't know. It did a number on me for sure. When I think about sounds that, like really fun, positive musical sounds, mm-hmm. like quirky sounds and songs, the beginning of Every Day's Winding Road was like, you know, before it actually, <laughs> does, does, yeah. that make, does that make sense? Duck, like, duck, duck, do, duck, yeah, duck, like duck, I, duck, I, duck. I hear that whole, I can mm-hmm. hear it all. Banner. Yeah. That, I'm always curious at why things get put in and left in and where there are conversations about where do we start this song and then, yeah. the, like, what, what is that story? Um, I, I, well, first and foremost, I'm, I, I got my degree in piano, um, in piano performance, but I could always play by ear. So I was never a great concert pianist, but everything else I've ever played, I've never taken a lesson. So I'm all self-taught and I would go into the studio and knowing that it wasn't ever going to be perfect, wasn't going to be slick. It seemed more interesting to me for it to be quirky and to be more, we, we call it ignorant more just kind of ignorant, you know, and some of the stuff that we left in was as cool as the stuff that we took out, you know, and, um, it's just always been that way. In fact, when I first worked, when I worked with Bill Bottrell, he would always say, if you, if you're a great piano player, you're not allowed to play piano. And so nobody ever got to play the instrument that they play because that way you were creating, like you were literally, you weren't just playing, you were creating. And I've sort of always stuck with it. I like that idea. I, that's one of the reasons I went up playing so many intr- instruments was that, okay, well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try this. And um, Vince Gill once said to me, I I love the way you produce records. Like, you'll have just some one little random thing that comes in, then you never hear it again. And it is kind of like that. It's like what fits the moment, what fits the lyric, the song, the the story. And it's just the way I approach record making. Mike, can you play that just from the beginning? Just the first. Uh... I mean, that. Mm-hmm. That. I, I could just hear that and know exactly what's that. That is oh, so cool. just. When I think of just that time, the early 2000s. I mean, yeah. I don't think I need the song. Just that. That, that can... should be on Hurdle. Do you know that, mm, that music, thing, Hurdle? The music yeah. Hurdle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is. Um, I've always wondered, like, why that? I love it. I know. It reminds I don't know. me of an entire era of my life. I do not know. Um, so the first album comes out, Tuesday Night Music Club, Mm -hmm. it has the hits. Second album comes out, you got two number ones again, which, and we're talking about not like a country genre, you're talking about massive number one, Billboard number one songs. Those two records go when you're getting ready to, again, for Come On, Come On, which is the next record. Uh, uh, Globe Sessions. Okay. Are you nervous? Is it is it less about I'm excited about what's happening or is it more about, oh, my God, can we keep it going? Like, when does that start to be the conversation? That started happening during Come On, Come On when I was about to turn 40. The um, the Globe sessions, I'd moved, uh, I would, had been engaged again, someone else. That fell apart. I moved to New York City, and everything about New York was inspiring, and I was also super rock you know, really emotional and I could not wait to get in and start writing. And that was, that was so much in line with how I'd made the second record, like just go in and just write and record. Um, the, the next record was tricky. That was the soak up the sun record. And it took a year and a half to make, it was a million and a half dollars, tons of starts and stops. I'd not start working in, you know, eight years. I'd been on the road constantly and you have to walk into a studio, A, having something to say, B, having some life experiences. And life experiences don't happen necessarily because you're famous and because you're on the road all the time. I mean, that's not real life. And and you don't want to write about that. Nobody wants to hear about, you know, your your Corvette breaking down. And it, it just, you need to go out and, and, and live and then come in and write, write a record. And 
that record really screwed me up. And by the time I put it out, I had spent a ton of money and just was like, is this even a good record? And luckily you can listen to the record and you can't really hear all the machinations that went into it. But, um, and there are a couple of things on that record I love and that are my favorite songs. But that was a hard one. In your process, because you're describing something that, that when I'm writing a joke or a funny bit, music for a stage show, mm-hmm. I'll do it so many times, I don't even know what's funny anymore. Yeah. Like, I'll I'll have, okay, let me change this word. I think this may hit better. And I'm like, guys, I, I don't ha- I can't tell. I've been inside of this joke so it. long. Yeah. I, so I have to just go, I thought the concept was hilarious. I have to stay with it. Yeah. Even though I don't feel I can find it anymore. Yeah. When you talk about that process, that's oh, yeah. what it felt like to me. Like, you're so in it. You spent so much money. You're pulling your hair out. How do you know what's good and what's not anymore? I know. And that that was the story of that record because I could not finish anything. And I think it's in the documentary. But I remember one of my first gigs was opening up for Bob Dylan. And I met him, and he was really generous. Like, anytime you need anything, call me. Here's my number. Let me know if I can ever help, blah, blah, blah. Saw him a few times through the years. Always had a great hang with him. So cut to this record and it's been like eight months and I've not finished one thing. I've got like 40 things in the can. I haven't finished anything. I've moved my studio from New York to my living room in LA. I've gotten to where I don't even want to walk into my house because there's like a throbbing organism in my living room saying, you need to be working. So my manager's like, why don't you call Bob Dylan? You know, he went through a period where he, he just could not finish anything. So I call Bob. I'm like, Hey, Cheryl Crow, how you doing? And I said, eh, man, I'm just calling you because I, I feel like I got this writer's block. And, and I, you know, I understand you went through a writer's block. He said, no, no, we did. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. And I said, uh, he, I, he said, when's the last time you finished this song? I said, it's been like about eight months ago. And he's like, ooh, that's bad. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's <laughs> happening? Um yeah, you know, it's it's a, it's it's awful and there's there's a point at which yeah, you just you have to walk away from it. Give yourself a little space. Chrissy Hahn was the one that said life is not your work. Your work is your work and your life is your life. And so I took off some time and I came back to it and I could sort of find the golden nugget in some of the stuff I was writing enough to be able to finish it. But um yeah, it does a number on you. And I, I don't know how you write a joke. I Because I'll write something. I'll write a song and I'll go, my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever written. And then I'll listen to it enough that I start picking it apart. And I'm like, this isn't even any good. What was I thinking? This is trash. That's everything I've ever written. But it no, usually, but I have it usually to tell is you, trash. You, you should have just stopped right at Namaste. That's like one of my favorite songs you of know, all what's, time. What's really weird about that is Nathan Chapman was in and he is produced all the Taylor stuff early. He's mm-hmm. written... And he was like, you know what was a really great song? And I'm thinking he's going to say, I don't know, some old George Strait. He's like, Namaste. And I'm like, stop. It is I just a think, great I song. I just think people are messing with me. No. Like, this is some joke. You I've, all text each other before they come no, over. No, I've, pl- I've sent it to everybody I know. I mean, I okay. even go around singing. My kids okay. even know it. I'm like, Namaste. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. When, I, I get embarrassed at that. Own it. So, uh, your live shows. You, you're still playing a lot. I was looking at the Beach Boy stuff you're doing, I think, in Ohio, the free mm-hmm. shows. You're out on tour, too. You have sh- so many songs that everybody knows all the, word to, all the words to. Do you still play them the same melody so we can sing along? Yes, I do. Thank God. Yes, Because, I'm going to tell you, I, I thought I was going to have to shake Adam Duritz for about 15 years. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. Yeah. He would yeah. De- a lot of times, because I, I know Adam, and we've done quite a lot together. It's been a very long time. But I'd be like, dude, I didn't even know what song you were singing. Same, and that's my favorite yeah. band ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm like, I can't I learned sing. my lesson on that. Two years, uh, we went out on the road, first first record. Uh, for a year, all we did was tour Colorado and France. Those were the only two places that played it. By the time the record won the Grammys, and it was huge, we, we were back on the road for a year and a half. And I started messing with all I want to do. We did it like a like a Jack Kerouac, like uh, spoken word, and people were pissed. And I know, I know how that is. When I go hear my favorite bands, I want them to sing it right down to the oh, you know. I want to hear the riffs. I want to sing the guitar solos. We we stick with it, and sometimes I have to go back and listen to my own stuff to remind myself. Am I, am I off living in Las Vegas? Am I singing it the exact same way? 
how do you indulge yourself in your set when you have to do so many things that you're doing for the fans? Like, mm -hmm. what will you do that makes you feel good during your set that's just for you as an artist? A ton of choreography. Okay, you're yeah. not doing no. choreography. <laughs> that's... <laughs> I I I perform, I I perform them second. naked. Okay. Um. No. I. Uh, that's really interesting. Um. I really, you know, part of it is I just enjoy it more now. You know, it it sounds kind of hokey, but after I had breast cancer, pre breast cancer, I didn't want to see a single face in the audience, and after that, I wanted to see everybody. I wanted to look people in the face or into their cameras, whatever. Um. I just wanted that connection. And now, you know, I'm 60. I can't even believe I'm saying it out loud. And my band and I, you know, we've been together a long time. We, every time we walk out and we're still alive, we're like, we're still alive. We're playing the old, you know, it's like we, we're, we're super stoked. We're super stoked. You know, it's like we get played at Home Depot and Whole Foods. We're, my jukebox. Yeah. We're, we're like music to shop to and we're, we're, you know, we, we played at um, Bonnaroo about three or four years ago, and I was like, man, who's going to come? And there were people there that were my, I mean, my kid's age, and they knew every word. It's just, it's a different thing now, you do, know? Do your kids understand how how differently awesome you were then as to how awesome you are now? Like, do they get it? I'm not, I'm not really. I'm sort of cringy, sweaty, try hard. Um, do you know those phrases? Mm -mm. I have a teenager. Oh, I know them mom, separately. Mom, you're so sweaty trying Got hard. it, got it. Yes. That is so cringy. Yeah, it's I know from yeah. TikTok, not from hanging yeah. out with teenagers. Just for the rug Yeah, okay, uh, let me ask your opinion. Should I, do, should I be on TikTok? You know, that's, yeah, the answer is yes. But what happens is, and it's not about you, I've also, and I think I talked to Tim McGraw about this too, who has quite the presence now. Mm -hmm. You have to really make sure what you're doing mm -hmm. is in line with who you are and not the trends of TikTok. Because if I got on there and I'm doing the dances yeah. and I'm doing some of the – it just looks like I'm an old guy trying to be 17. Yeah. However, it is a platform for anything now. You're a bird-watching expert. They got people that will show you the coolest birds that they see from their phone. So it's you – I mean, it goes back to just being a creative, you doing what you do for people who like you. The answer is yes, the long answer. Well, I got asked – by the powers that be that would like me to promote more, um, to be on TikTok talk and my kids, I thought their heads were gonna explode. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, Mom, you cannot be on TikTok. That is so cringy. As long as you're not doing the sound, you're f it would be awesome. I like, was like, What if we light our farts? Come on, who doesn't think that's funny? Uh, that's the one thing you should do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. only that. If you yeah. only made that your thing, uh -huh. you'd have so many followers. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, TikTok to me is the, the best because. It's, there's just so many creatives there. Yeah. Right. Aside from all the trendy things, I think you should get on TikTok because uh, there's just you know all... this lady Babs. Mm -mm. Is that her name? What is it? Brunch with Babs. Yeah. I don't know. I gotta you think about it. Are you are you on TikTok? Are you no, watching them? I'm embarrassed to say that I don't do social uh, media at all. Well, I'm, I've been I participate with... in it. I do participate in it. Like I know what we post and right. I'm involved in it. Do I go on and look at it? Absolutely not. I gave my life is too full. Cheryl Crow two four three eight five hundred bucks an Apple gift card yesterday. I thought it was you. See, this is another thing. We've have you. I mean, I go on and post. I'm like, people, please know, I don't need the money. Yeah, well, I'll take the money. I don't need the money. I'm not asking you for it. That's a whole weird thing. People have. I had a woman my name too. show up at my gate with a U-Haul recently at eleven thirty at night. She said her computer told it was told her it was okay for her to come and that I was. Her, her, what did her computer? Is that somebody talking to her as I you? Don't. Or I, I, I wouldn't have asked a, questions either. She's been a. Um, I didn't know who she was, and I don't. I don't know about the people that are cuckoo for cocoa pops, but um, I guess she's been a Uber fan for a long time, and you know, it was up it was me in a wig. It was. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. I would have let you in. My you should have sung Namaste. Yeah, my, I would have yeah. known. I have a few more, and I want to. We did a whole intro here talking about the documentary and. The, the song, which we're also featuring on the national show that I'm doing, which is just great. It's in the, the not the beginning, the credits. Oh, yeah, forever. Credit, forever. And mm -hmm. then the the album that comes out on the 6th at the same time. They call that a companion album. Just getting my words right. Right, guys? Mm -hmm. it's I did a not know that. Right? Isn't that right, Mike? Yeah. An accompanying, accompanying, no, I don't know. Yeah, so and we spent time telling people how they can watch it. May 6th on Showtime. It is gritty. It is beautiful. 
It is a documentary that you don't even have to be a fan of you to like the art. And I think that's how I try to watch them now because there's some really good ones out there. And the fact that you didn't want to do that VH1 style says a lot about what you want to represent you. Um, it, it reminds me a bit of when I read uh, Steve Jobs' book and he wanted the, the, the documentary and the guy was with him to write the book. Mm -hmm. He didn't want, he was like, finish it before I ever get to read it. I want you to do the most real version that you can do. It just felt like that is what you wanted portrayed. Whether you did or not, it just felt like that. You wanted, because there were some things, like I mentioned way earlier, that had, couldn't have been comfortable to have to talk mm -hmm. about again. But I just, my appreciation for that piece is super high, aside from being a massive fan of you. So if you're listening to this and you're not familiar with Cheryl's music, it's a, just a great documentary as well. So kudos to your team you. and for you for being very vulnerable in that situation. It was, I mean, it was interesting because I only watched it once. And, you know, you, you basically hand over your story to um, a director. Amy was fantastic. But, you know, three-fourths of it wound up on the cutting room floor. And I made a couple of suggestions which did not make the cut because they basically decided what the story was. And the reality of it is for me is that I am a real person. I think we forget that sometimes. And there's a whole world... Um, that goes into making a person particularly want to be an artist, particularly want to raise their voice up into the fray, but also that makes them who they are. And I did an interview with a guy recently um, for a newspaper who said, I watched the 90 minutes and it defied everything that I thought about you. And that made me feel good because I'm like, there are a lot of people that aren't fans, but that might get something out of it. And there is a good story there, you know, and we are all people. I think sometimes we forget, especially now more than ever, that, um, you know, at the core, you're just like a little kid from small town. I have a few brief questions to wrap this up. I do want to say at the beginning of this, of this last segment here, I, you got to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like, you, I mean, it's... It, I, it, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how those things work. No, no, I'm just saying. Oh. I'm not, I, I don't think you can call somebody and go like, hey, Bobby just said I'm in. I know that can't happen. <laughs> Jason but, Isbell already did that. But it just, it doesn't feel complete without you in it. And the body of work that you can present as data, mm -hmm. but also what you've done as a person. It just feels like if there is someone from our generation mm -hmm. that deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it is just you oh thank you i don't you know i i, I it's hard for me to even say anything yeah that. i mean it's you know it's uh and don't and don't say anything yeah i'll leave it at that i mean i, I appreciate you that just, very much it, it is there's no reason i that. have had a great run i mean i will say that and you know it's a weird thing to be what they call a legacy artist because it basically means you're still around um but i do i'm loving the second half i feel like i have so much more in me so, you know, if I if I become a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, cool. If I don't, still going to keep going. Uh, talk about Nashville. Why are you here? Well, I grew up three hours from here. Um, my sister lived here, has lived here for years and years and years. When I got diagnosed, I felt like I've been in L.A. 23 years, and I don't even have a church. I just felt like I didn't ever put any roots down. I, it was always a stopping off place, and yet 23 years later, I was still there. And that was such a game changer. I decided, you know what, I'm going to move closer to home. I can either move to Memphis because there's an airport, or I can move to Nashville. And I had friends here, um, you know, Amy Lou, Vince. They were people I knew and that I loved, Amy Grant, um, and my sister. And I put down roots here, and it's just been an incredible place. Is it homey, homish? It's not home, but is Nashville? Yeah, I mean, it's my kids are living a normal life. Um, you know, like I said, they're not on social media, and they go to school like every other kid. And they're living what I consider to be, you know, the kind of life I lived. I don't know if anybody will ever be able to live the kind of life where you get on your bike and you come back at dinner. But they are as close as possible living um, the kind of life I did, which is a normal life. Your kids, their uh, their faces in the documentary. First time. Yeah. Yeah. I I was like, wow. I've I've seen them in yeah. human form at being yeah. in Nashville. Yeah. Um, but I was like, wow. So what was that decision? Why? Well, 
yeah, I can't tell my story without them. And um, they are the biggest part of my story. I just have never had them on social media because, you know, I felt like for a long time celebrities use their kids like, like an expensive handbag. Like, look how beautiful my kids are. And, um, and I did find that when I lived in L.A., um, or at least was there still with my little ones before I sold my house, having paparazzi chase them around was, there's, that's just not right. You know, I'd rather them be able to be anonymous. And then if they want to get out there, then at which point they're mature enough to understand how it works, they can do that. So That's one. Here's two of three. Okay. Woodstock 99. I did watch the documentary. You have a, an appearance in it briefly. Did you see the documentary? What is it? Woodstock 99. Oh, yes. Yeah, I didn't see it, but um, what, yeah. What the, yeah, what the Was age? it like that? Real? You were an it artist, was, so you were separated a bit, right? But what was it like for you? It was, uh, it, whatever I can tell you, it was worse than that. Whatever you can envision, it was absolutely awful. And it makes me sad because the first, the very first one, obviously, I wasn't at. The second one was, I mean, euphoric. It was such a beautiful celebration of the first one. The next one was what was wrong. What, it was everything with what was wrong with what the music business was becoming, which was money, 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 money. And it was degrading to women. It was a demonstration of the worst of what's in us with people throwing feces and throwing pennies and water bottles. It was just a bizarre experience. And even the bill wasn't, it was not a, it was not a bill that was sensitive to people coming together and being a part of something cool and peaceful, which is what Woodstock is emblematic it, it was of. pretty you know? angry. The bill was pretty angry. It was like Andy Dick and then Sheryl Crow and then the insane clown posse. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, what is happening here? Um, I didn't even finish my set. I mean, at which point well, okay, you didn't feces finish your... landed on my on no the, way. my base neck. I was like, yeah, you know what? Did you just peace out? Walk I, off? I was like, yeah, I was. I just walked up to the mic and I was like, I'm done. Okay, well, yeah, uh, let's it was end, brutal. Let's end on this one. So it's, uh, I want to know what makes you happy now. Like, where do you find your fulfillment? Oh, my gosh. Which is a tough one. Okay. And then I want to, at the very end of that, in parentheses, how come all my friends get to go to your barn parties and I never get invited? But let's get that at the very oh end. Oh, my okay, gosh. Okay, hold on. Here we go. It will never happen no, again. Here we go. <laughs> this is the first, the real part of the question okay. is, like, what? Okay. what is it now that fulfills you? My joy. Uh, my joy comes from uh, just, man, watching my kids grow. It is such an honor and such i'm every day i'm like you guys i'm so excited i'm so happy i get to be your mom i mean look my kids are adopted and i'm telling you what god was all over up and through and then uh we have a french bulldog that makes all of us laugh in fact sometimes we look at each other and go who were we who were we before buster we were no one um and barn parties you know it's it's sort of tragic i used to have barn parties a lot in fact, I used to always have a Christmas party, and then it slowed down before the pandemic, and then it screeched to a halt, and I just haven't gotten back to no, it. No, I'm just saying. Like, there there wasn't even a real question. There wasn't even a real question. Be one just a little tag on Without the end. you. Like, you have all these, and I go, hey, well, I was over sure. And you like, and Caitlin have to come. I was like, oh, yeah, that must be cool. It's okay. Let's do a fundraiser there, and you guys can play. We would do I'll that. I'll sit in with you. We would do that. No, 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 no. For Ukraine. I'm not. I, I'm not. You s- wouldn't let me sit in on Namaste? I would. I would be embarrassed if Why? I would sit in and do one and then enjoy. No one cares. I would love that. Here's what I'll do. And I'll tell okay. you this because I have okay. a, one of my dearest friends is Brett Eldridge. It's like, my, I love, that's like my, oh my gosh, my best friend. Like, I love as him. Far as, I, I know. Have, I saw you guys. At, oh, that's uh, right. We were dinner. Yes. <laughs> that's right. His voice is redonkulous. It's, it's fine. I've heard better. Anyway, so <laughs> I tell Brett all the time, like, when you want, because you know when Tell you. Tell him I love his Christmas album. Okay, when, go ahead. When you have friends, uh-huh. there's that fine line of work and, and business. Yeah. Or was well, the same thing, work and friendship. And yeah. I'm like, hey, dude, if you're going to do some sort of charity event, like mm-hmm. you're my guy, like I love you. Yeah. I will do stand up. I will host it. You do the mute, whatever. Just yeah. let me know what you need. Yeah. And so I'm. I will also tell you that right now. If you're doing something here, let's do something for Ukraine. And you need that. It kills it, me. We can't do anything. I will do comedy. Okay. I will do whatever you need. Okay. If you're also, I'll doing get the it, valet Parker. Don't feel like it's. Oh no, no, no! You got to do more than that. But <laughs> I'll get the Martin's barbecue. I love what I'll stock the bar. What no. you stand for. I oh. just, just a. If you need me, please, I'm here. I'm gonna call you. You no, I would. Well, I would be disappointed if you didn't, but you never have. So I'm just gonna assume you're not going to. I don't have. I have to. Tw- I have to like face. Uh, what do you do? You know, I'm always like telling Liz does my social media. 
Liz, you've got to post this, and I'll send her like something about something I just heard on Bobby Bone Show in the morning. Um, okay, yeah. but I'm here for you. Okay, all right. And that's I'll all. take you and, up and, on and, it, and we'll end up. And I don't say things if I don't mean it, so don't go. Well, he said it on a microphone, so I mean, I, I'm li- I'm looking at you in the eyes right now. Let me know what you. Know. I will take you up on it. Um, everybody, check out the documentary. It's great. It's just a great piece of work aside from her large body of work that has been wildly successful. So May 6th on Showtime, um, and then May 8th again on Mother's Day. And I, I'm assuming you'll be able to just stream it well, on the Showtime app. Stream it, yep. I got the Showtime app to watch uh, Yellow Jacket. Did you ever watch that show? Oh, my gosh. Did you finish it? I have not. Have you started it? I've started it, but I haven't finished it. I'm in season one. Oh, well, there's only season one. Oh, okay, good. About the girls that crashed the plane? Yes. Yeah, only yeah. season one. Is there not another season? No. Okay. Just one. But I want to watch the Tim and Faith also. What do you mean? Tim and Faith one. Tim and Faith what? There isn't that the oh, precursor. Oh, eighteen eighty three. No, 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 no. That's not the precursor to Yellow. Yep. No, Yellow Jacket. Oh, Yellow Jacket. Oh no, I haven't seen that. Two totally different shows. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. On Showtime, it's a. <laughs> it's a okay. It's a it's a soccer <laughs> team, high school soccer team that crashes and they have to survive and. The, I've heard about Yellowstone. Yeah, I have Yellowstone. Seen all of. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yes. And then that's it. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm sixty. See, that's the way it works. But that's the thing. You don't. It, but I don't even know what 60 means anymore because I know. it's not a thing to be 60 and that just means something I know. because of the number you are. I know, but it has been really fun talking with you, Billy. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Did I call you something wrong? No, I'm just saying I'm 60, so I called you Billy. Oh, oh okay. you see, know, you see? I didn't, but oh, it didn't connect oh, okay. because I don't associate 60 with old. Oh, okay. Oh, That's okay. the thing. Yeah, okay. I'll take it. So I'll take the it. The joke fell so flat because I didn't. Even think that was what the concept was. Yeah, okay. So I'll that. tell you what. You, I'll stick with music, and then you just stick with comedy. And I, I so won't, don't do I music won't, anymore. No, uh, I'll try, no, I'll try not to break into the comedy thing, because it yeah, doesn't really okay. work. I'm, I'm opening for Garth in a week and a half. At, you are? Mm-hmm. Is he playing at uh, uh, Bridgestone? He's playing it here in Nissan Stadium, the Nissan football stadium. stadium but right. he, he asked me to come to Arkansas. He's playing at the Razorback Stadium. 80,000 people, and he's like, come, do, come. Oh, um, that it's is. It's awesome. That is cool. We're not even going to play Namaste, though. I'm not, I'm not yeah. I hate you. All right, there we go. Uh, Cheryl, you're the best. All right. Thank it's you. It's fun to be here with you. Thank you. I'm getting and your that, number. That is it. Cheryl Crow, everybody.